Hello, everyone. Today on the final bar, happy Fed Day. We'll try to digest what the uh, Fed announcements means for the, uh, for the markets. You know, the S&P choppy for most of the day, but finishing in a position of weakness, really selling off into the close. Today, continuing the theme we've seen so far this week with technology continuing to perform well. Stocks like Apple, Microsoft continue to blow out to new highs while financials and energy struggling. So we'll see what's next for the equity markets. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the final bar. Hello, everyone. Welcome to The Final Bar. I'm your host, Dave Keller. I'm the Chief Market Strategist here at StockCharts.com in Redmond, Washington. Thanks for joining us every weekday after the close to look at the charts together, hopefully inspire you to dig deeper into some of the trends and themes, momentum that we talk about on the show. And in 30 minutes, we love to try to hit as many ideas, as many themes as we can. And, and again, the goal is to empower you to, to take it further and, uh, and, and evaluate your own positioning, evaluate your own, uh, your own thinking over time. You know, today on, on a Fed day, it's always sort of wait and see mode to see how things play out. One of our segments today is clipping coupons, really focusing on the fixed income markets. I think what, what this means for uh, bonds and interest rates for the next, uh, the next couple of weeks. Also have a, a great guest, Mark Ungewitter from uh, Charter Trust, who's on the show back in January. I'd be interested to see how his thinking has changed because the market has certainly evolved since his last appearance, and we'll get a sense of what he's seeing uh, in terms of the breadth and the overall market direction. In terms of coming up on, on this show and elsewhere on Stock Charts TV, we, we are so fortunate to have great guests like Mark on the show regularly. Tomorrow, we have Xenia Taubina joining us for the first time. She's from XT Financial Services. Uh, on the 12th, on June 12th, is our next episode of The Pitch. We did a trial run of that show a couple months ago. Uh, with one host and then three guest experts all pitching five ideas apiece, then talk about it as a group. It went really well. So we did our first sort of formal monthly broadcast uh, last month featuring Grayson Rose as our moderator. We're going to do it again on June uh, 12th, a couple days out with uh, Tom Bowley uh, hosting and, uh, and some great guest commentators providing their ideas. Next week on this show, we have Jeff Greenblatt on the 16th, Jay Pettit on the 17th, and also our next episode of Behind the Charts coming up the, uh, next Monday is Mike Turner from Turner uh, Capital Management with his uh, sort of background and how he evolved uh, turning into a, uh, a systematic, technically oriented money manager. So a lot of great content. And again, we're so blessed, I think, on Stock Charts TV to be able to bring on guests that uh, can share some of their expertise, share some of their ideas of, uh, of what they see around them. Let's get to our market recap. So as I mentioned, a Fed day usually is pretty choppy. And after the 2 p.m. announcement, usually have a bit of a reaction, quite a bit of volatility. But if you try to look at where things ended up, the S&P finishing more toward the lows of the day than the highs of the day, finishing down about half a percent from yesterday, putting it back below the 3,200 level. So the S&P at 3,190, the Dow down a little bit more than that over 1%. Uh, looking at mid caps down 2.5%, small caps down 3.5%. So this idea of small and mid cap outperformance has dried up very quickly as the market has once again now started to mean revert a little bit. And you had that, uh, you know, finance energy rallying pretty big. All of a sudden you had small caps, mid caps at times doing well. Today we're back to that mega cap technology led environment. The SP finishing lower, but the NASDAQ 100 finishing higher, one and a quarter percent higher in the tech sector, the only of the 11 uh, up there. So while you know, the average stock is weaker today. Apple looks kind of like this. Microsoft, not too different. Breaking to new closing highs, new 52-week highs. So certainly a return to the, the dominance of the, uh, we'll call the Fangman trade or whatever acronym we're using these days to describe those big, you know, Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, uh, Microsoft-y type, uh, type of stocks that are certainly uh, leading the way higher. Let's look at some of the other asset classes and we'll dig into the charts uh, individually. We're going to focus on uh, fixed income a little bit later, but I think it's worth noting the TLT, the bond ETF, finished up pretty strong, closing near the highs of the days, up one and a half percent. This is after a period of short-term weakness for uh, for uh, bond futures and, and uh, bond ETFs as well. 10-year yield now down to 75 basis points, and again, based on uh, the Fed's changing or the Fed's uh, announcement of their latest 
uh, policy. The dollar continues to weaken. That's a trend we're going to look at in a little bit uh, as well. On the commodity side, gold certainly finishing uh, stronger, uh, you know, coming through as a safe haven of sorts today, up almost one and a half percent. Other precious metals up as well, with silver up over uh, three percent. Uh, overall, commodities uh, up a little bit. Oil sort of flat for the uh, for the day, with energy down significantly, almost five percent on the XLE. Let's look at a chart of the S and P five hundred. What this sort of means for everything. So, you know, the challenge we've talked about this week is we had this dominance of technology, and then in the last couple of weeks, we sort of rotated away from that. Tech underperforming a bit, healthcare underperforming. We're rotating to energy, to financials, to industrials. Um, those are the groups that have done very well. The S&P now becoming overbought on the daily chart with an RSI above 70. It's back down now through the overbought region, which again, all else being equal, usually suggests a bit of a, a further weakness from here. And so, you know, certainly the way things have come out with the Fed not, you know, doing anything dramatic besides just saying they're ready to continue to do whatever they need to. I don't know if that's any new news. It feels like that's sort of priced in. And I think that's why you see the, the market closing down on uh, on it. They didn't raise rates, so that's good uh, for, I, I think, overall for uh, investors. That would have certainly been felt like sort of a uh, sort of a hit. But at this point, uh, stocks figuring, f finishing a little weaker. Now, what did not finish weaker was technology. And again, that's the real challenge, right? You can still own equities, it seems like, but just not the broad S&P certainly feels uh, weaker as those stocks that had been doing very well, financials and energy really started to rotate, uh, rotate lower. As we've talked about, short-term trend remains positive, medium-term trend remains positive. The overextended conditions that we're seeing suggest at least a short-term pullback. You know, for me, big picture, I'm looking at the 200-day moving average, the 3,000 level. This is the level that we've been talking about and have certainly been keying off of on the way up. And I think on any sort of pullback, remaining above there would be pretty key to maintaining an overall sort of bullish outlook and a return to previous, uh, previous highs. Getting back to sectors, so tech number one, all the other sectors down. Healthcare was sort of flat for the day, followed by consumer staples. On the downside, you have energy down almost 5%. Financials down 3.7%. This is after the XLF had tested uh, its 200-day moving average from below. We talked about this in a little more detail uh, yesterday, but if you look, today really pulled back and changed the characteristics of this chart to, uh, to, to quite a bit. You know, one of the things we, I was looking at yesterday was this uh, balance between the 200-day moving average we were trying to break above, between the 38.2% level, which was just below. We've now broken back below there. So while the trend remains positive in terms of higher highs, higher lows and the last swing low is all the way down here around 23, 25 or so. So we need to really get below there to signal a, a short-term reversal based on kind of the classic Charles Dow analysis. So, you know, it suggests to me that, you know, expecting sort of a move back down to this 38.2% level is not that unreasonable for the financial sector and the relative strength obviously coming down a little bit uh, as other sectors emerged and, uh, and we're a little stronger today. In terms of groups that have done well and done poorly, I think it's worth noting that there's been a bit of a reversal, certainly with the uh, airlines. That's also part of this, you know, industrial energy, financials, materials trade that have been doing so well. Airlines went vertical and, and sort of had this distribution candle. If you look, the big up candle on American Airlines about a week ago, followed by a gap higher, but closing lower than the open. And since then, it's been uh, a bit of distribution. And so uh, AAL, one of the biggest uh, losers in the scooter rankings today. Gap was the number one uh, loser really coming off a previous high. It had gotten above 13 and now it's all the way back down to 11 in just two sessions. In terms of things that have gained, it's actually interesting to see some healthcare in here. So Abbott Labs, Johnson & Johnson, you can see some other uh, healthcare related names all on here. So if we look at Johnny John, for example, again, not the most gorgeous chart I've ever seen by any means, but I'm seeing a stock that has rallied and then it's pulled back to an ascending 50-day moving average. So in an ideal world, that sort of feels like a buy on the dips type of pattern. And, uh, you know, a strong trend that pulls back to the 50-day more often than not ends up being an interesting sort of buy point. So interesting to see healthcare, also a lot of biotechs look kind of like this, pulling back to some potential, uh, you know, viable pullback areas. Home builders come to mind as maybe another group. I don't know how DR Horton sort of finished today. Um, yeah, not yet, actually not near its 50-day, but pulling back a little bit, you can see off the the previous high. So some of those groups actually finishing a little stronger today and holding up while the market overall uh, finished lower. So it might be interesting to see if this is the beginning of a rotation back to some of those themes, but uh, has not happened uh, has not happened yet for sure. 
In terms of the rest of the, uh, the markets and making sense from a recap perspective, I think it's worth noting that the China ETFs continue to impress. MCHI is one of the ones we follow along with the FXI, um, has continued to do pretty well on a price basis. The relative ba basis is not much to speak of. Overall, the relative uh, strength has been negative really since the market low in the U.S. in March, uh, March 23rd. But overall, it's worth noting it's a consistent pattern of higher highs, higher lows, finishing higher today. Uh, and overall, uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a position of strength, sort of retesting those previous highs. But uh, the MCHI, Taiwan, FXI, South Korea, all the Asian-related ETFs for the most part up today and, uh, and doing okay. In terms of groups, worth noting we've had a, a return back to that gold mining and mining theme. Again, coming off of quite a pullback, and, and Newmont Mining and others had been some of the top scoring stocks according to our scooter rankings had all come off that list uh, as the group sort of rolled over but rallied pretty good today on a day when the average stock was down but the real story i think automobiles gapping higher tech uh, we have software computer hardware semiconductors all in the top 10 so that sector certainly reclaiming uh, its uh, its place in the uh, in the bellwether category on the downside you'll see some financials like banks airlines some consumer groups uh, as well. That's all we have for the market recap. A lot of interesting movements. And again, we're going to dig into uh, the fixed income mar markets uh, a little later in the show. We're going to take a break now back with my guest, Mark Ungerwitter from Charter Trust. We'll see you in a minute. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the show. This is Dave Keller here at StockCharts.com. Thanks for joining us every weekday after the close for the final bar. As a reminder, we love to answer your questions. We had a mailbag segment yesterday answering some really thoughtful questions about technical analysis, moving averages in particular. So any other questions you have as the week goes on, shoot it to us via email, the final bar at StockCharts.com. We'll gather all those questions. We'll answer some of them on the air uh, coming up this Friday in our next mailbag segment. I want to welcome on uh, our guest, Mark Ungerwitter from Charter Trust. Mark's growing, uh, joining us from, the, uh, from New England, from New Hampshire. Mark, welcome back to the show. Hi, David. Thank you. Uh, great so, to be here. Uh, yeah, thank you so much for joining us on Fed Day. Obviously, a lot of uncertainty going into the day and just, you know, the market has rallied so much into where we're at right now. The V bottom has now played out. You know, using your toolkit, using your perspective, what are you seeing now? Where do we go from here? Um, okay, yeah, we are, to, uh, by way of background, we are asset allocators, so we're interested in long-term trends, and we make gradual adjustments, so the past few months have been interesting. Um, when we last talked in January, um, I was expecting, we were seeing an overbought sentiment in a mid, what we thought was a mid-cycle setting uh, with no obvious um, erosion or deterioration in the market, and so we were expecting a uh, four, 4 to 8 percent correction. Well, that's not what we got. Uh, adjust and move on. Uh, we labeled the bear market in early March. Uh, the panic was sudden. Uh, we chose not to, to, to sell into VIX, you know, VIX above 30, 40, 50. Um, we did, we did uh, act defensively when the market retraced 40 to 60 percent coming back up. Um, and, then, and then we rebought the market in late May on the, on the signal in this the chart that I'll explain here. Uh, this this chart um, is a um, based on on the, the, the kind of the Paul Desmond concept that um, a bear market doesn't end until um, panic selling is followed by panic buying. Mm. Uh, this is one way to view that. There are many. Um, this looks at the percentage of uh, S and P stocks uh, participating above the 50-day average. Um, and I further, I've added a condition that there, there's first 85% of S&P stocks below their 50-day average. So we've had 16 um, such signals since 1970. That's about one every three years. 
and they have they have come at the at the beginning of a of a of a cyclical uh, advance. Uh, you can see the follow through. Um, interestingly, there there was no there was no signal after the 1987 trial. There was no signal after the 1994 trial. Um, but all in all, um, a great indicator. So. Uh, we, so we're strategically bullish now, but not necessarily tactically bullish, uh, because as you say, the market is very steep, very fast, book call ratios, et cetera. Mm. Uh, but we have learned that um, there, there are times, you know, there are contexts for, uh, for these indicators. And so the book call ratio might not be as important. It might actually be part of the thrust. Mm -hmm. So, uh, uh, we're not expecting a, a, a great pullback or a pullback from higher levels. We think it would be a buying opportunity. In the lower inset, and I, and I think this will help illustrate that, in the lower inset, um, I've, I've tried to show that the, the characteristic of a, of a thrust, and, and this is not the only thrust signal. We, we, we have what, what Tom McClellan calls gobs of thrust right now, whether it's swag thrust, uh, whether it's uh, wally thrust, Mm. Whether it's uh, um, Walter Deemer's breakaway momentum, we've seen them all over the over the past two weeks. That's right. Uh, and the character, the character, the the uh, with, with a thrust, what usually happens is is it doesn't give you pullbacks. And and that table is looking at the um, the nine weeks. It's basis of a Friday close, so it doesn't capture you know the entire drawdown uh, potential. But uh, basis Friday cl uh, close. You, there was only one example that was 2011 where you really had a significant um, um, correction or drawdown and even that and even that was you can see it and you can see it uh, uh, you know uh, you can almost see the detail if you brought it in you could see the detail even that was a cyclical bottom but in in 2011 you didn't have uh, the breakaway momentum signal that we saw on June 3rd that's the 10 day uh, NYSC 10 day uh, advanced decline ratio of two to one. So right. all in all, this, this presents a strategically uh, bullish um, outlook. It's so interesting. You mentioned Paul Desmond, who was at Lowry's for a number of a number of years down in Florida. I learned a ton about Brett just from following his work and and uh, and the Lowry reports. But it's interesting, you know, a lot of the the work that I've seen it focuses on the potential upside, not as much on the minimal drawdown, which is actually kind of an interesting way to to think about it. It's really helpful. The, the, we only have a minute left, Mark. But the second chart you saw, so I thought was really interesting, which is looking at a little different view: the percent of stocks above their two hundred day moving average. How does this compare to what we just looked at? Right. So this we would be looking for a, a confirmation from this. Hmm. And we're looking again conditionally for uh, times when you have what I call a breadth wipeout. So more than 80 percent of stock below the 20 line there, more than 80 percent of stocks are. are and these are uh, NYSC common stocks. And hmm. it's just it's just because that's what I have you know, that, that goes back that far. And, and, and then a uh, it's not really a thrust, but then a. Um, a, a, particip a healthy participation back above 50% uh, would, be a, would be a confirmation. Uh, and that's a pretty good indicator. It's, it's obviously going to come, uh, take more time to develop. Um, but you, interestingly, uh, you did have signals after the 1987 bottom, uh, uh, lower left, March 88, and then after the 1994 bottom, uh, where the signals were absent. Um, on the 50-day uh, uh, breadth momentum. Very interesting. So looking for a signal there that would confirm sort of what we saw with the previous chart about sort of a follow-through on the upside with, uh, with uh, on the breadth side. Mark Ungerwitter, this is such a pleasure to have you back on the show. Thanks for sharing a couple charts with us. And listen, hope you and the, and the family stay safe out there. And, uh, and we'll look forward to having you back on soon, all right? Thanks a lot, David. You too. This is Mark Ungewitter joining us from Charter Trust. He's based in the uh, Boston area. And I love that, uh, that idea. Again, I think a lot of people get really caught up with breadth readings in the short term. And they're interesting on the tactical side. Don't get me wrong. I think there's a lot of uh, compelling signals you can get there. But what I love about Mark's perspective is it's, it's, it's applying it more to the longer term. What tends to happen after some of these signals play out? And uh, a really, really helpful perspective as Mark Ungewitter. We're gonna move on to our next segment called Clipping Coupons. So our goal is to look at the fixed income markets, which we love to do occasionally. It felt like an appropriate time to do it today. 
with the uh, the Fed meeting, the Fed report, and, and again, the, the market sort of treading water a bit until the announcement and then uh, sort of digesting the, the commentary. Uh, and it's so funny. I remember years ago when, uh, when, and again, this is not that long, I'm not that old, but you know, early 2000s where you'd you know, have people over time start dissecting and, and on, on the air you'd have people dissecting the language and how it changes. People are still doing that, but on Twitter, moments after the announcement, I'm seeing people send highlighted transcripts around. So it's fascinating how that whole practice has, uh, has evolved. But I think the idea is the same, just trying to get a sense of how the Fed, which arguably has had a huge hand in the movements that we're seeing right now, what the, what the potential, uh, you know, how to price some of that, those expectations in. But speaking of the longer term, what I want to do is just start with an asset allocation view, looking at the big picture of how some of these assets have evolved. Then we're going to focus a little bit just briefly on the dollar and then talk about uh, the, the uh, interest rates and the fixed income markets going forward. So, you know, relative performance of assets can look very different. You can, this is one of those things where I think you can make the data look exactly how you want it to, depending on your starting point, right? So if I start the clock in December of, uh, of 2018 at that market low, or if I started at the February peak, or if I started at the March low, I can give you a very different picture of the relative performance. What I wanted to do just because, you know, technology has round tripped essentially from the, the February, January, February peak all the way down losing 30 some percent and now retracing that all the way back to the previous highs. I just want to show how asset classes have performed since that uh, moment, since the peak in February. And we're looking at just major ETFs and I've sort of highlighted them here in text. So the S&P 500, and again, I, I took this a, a little bit ago, but I think it's about where we locked in on the close down just under 5% off of the uh, February 2020 highs. The biggest uh, loser, crude oil, still down 70% in the form of the USO. Now, again, that you know, I'm using the USO as a proxy here. If you do the crude oil spot price, it's going to get a little different uh, return profile for sure. The UUP in the form of the dollar uh, down 3.6%. The two that are positive looking at that time frame is gold up 7.7% and bonds in the form of the TLT up 11%. So while we're so laser focused on equities and the incredible rally out of the March lows, it's a good reminder that if you just bought the TLT at the market peak in February and just held on to that, you'd be up 11% instead of down 5%. Now, granted, you would have missed out on the big run in equities, but overall bond prices have held up very, very well. I think a lot longer than a lot of people have expected. Also uh, gold, right, going to, uh, to new swing highs arguably this week. So let's look a little bit at the dollar because I think this weakening dollar story is something interesting that's going to impact a lot of things. And then we'll switch gears and look at uh, the fixed income markets in, uh, in detail. Now we've talked about the dollar index, a couple different ways you can do it. The UUP is a great way to look at short-term movements, but the uh, dollar sign USD is the dollar uh, spot price essentially, right? The dollar index, and it's the dollar weighted against a series of other currencies, but it's sort of the, uh, the best way to get a long-term trajectory in, uh, in the US dollar. This sideways move in the dollar is what happened after the big dislocation. This was in the February to March period when, when stocks are, are tanking. The, the, uh, the U.S. dollar index actually rallied significantly into the March lows, came back to earth, and then was sort of in this choppy sideways range. In the last four weeks, though, you've had a huge breakdown in the, uh, in the dollar index, breaking below the swing lows from April and the beginning of May, now breaking below the 200-day moving average, now continuing uh, lower and arguably with not much support in sight until we get right about to where we're at. And I think between the 94.50 to 96 level, which I know is a pretty broad uh, level, but this is where most bottoms in the last two years have sort of come, right? It's since the, the rally of the dollar in 2018, which was that first big sort of pullback that we saw here after the fall pullback in 2018, we pulled back to around 95 and then rallied and we've retested that 95 to 96 level a bunch of times and we're there. So we're now right back at support. We are oversold, which suggests to me to expect a bit of a rally in the dollar, even you know at the very least a bit of a short-term rally. But overall, the trend remains pretty negative, and that's the momentum that I would be uh, expecting to continue. Now, when we look at bonds, there are a number of different ways we can look at it. The TLT is one. We can look at the HYG, which is the junk bond ETF. We can also look at yields, and we'll try to just hit them uh, one, two, three, very quickly, just talk about some of the, the perspectives. So the TLT, if you look at it, right, had sort of this consolidation in the fall, rallied in the beginning of, uh, of this year, and it was a tale of two, uh, you know, bond markets. The one in late 2019 was sort of a consolidative market, sideways prices, yield stabilizing, it didn't feel like it was really moving. 
And then January happens and it rallies significantly with the TLT peaking uh, in early March. That's before the, uh, the uh, equity markets uh, bottomed out in, uh, in late March. Since then, bond prices have rolled over a little bit. They held up for quite a while, though, and held above their 50-day moving average. It felt like that might have worked until we broke down. Now what's happened in the last week is we've seen a, a big reversal. At this point, we're retesting the support from uh, the beginning of May. This was a, a support level tested a number of times. Lines up with the 61.8% retracement of that overall move from late 2019 to early 2020. And so I think that 161, 162 level is pretty important to see if we're able to eclipse that and hold it. The RSI never became oversold, but certainly in the lower, uh, lower end of the range here. Now, the other thing we do is look at the HYG. This is the um, uh, junk bond ETF. Uh, if you remember this big gap that you see, sort of the crazy movement that you saw in uh, March to April is when the Fed announced that they were actually buying uh, bond ETFs in the form of the HYG. And as you can see, that's become uh, overbought recently, similar to the chart of the S&P. So there are a lot of similarities between uh, those two charts here in terms of the timing of it and in terms of where it's at. Coming out of an overbought condition, I think the question is, is it able to hold that 200-day moving average as it pulls back a little bit, which is pretty reasonable? Coming out of the overbought region, is it able to persist? But overall, higher highs and higher lows uh, mean an uptrend. Now, what does all of this mean relative to uh, yields, relative to interest rates? So this is the chart we looked at, and I put this uh, image on here. I did not realize how much of a diving off a cliff that would end up being, but it certainly felt when we broke to new swing lows, that that was a, a significant downturn. I remember reminding everyone, don't confuse the bottom of the page with support. The yields can go much lower than you might expect. What's happened though, is yields have come up and this is as, as uh, the financial sector did very, very well. The last week, the characteristics have changed quite a deal and we're pulling back within that range. And so I think the question is, are we remaining? Do we find support in this range? That would suggest uh, a, uh, a, a rise in yields, a continued upside. But I think the the intentions of the Fed being what they are, yields appear to be coming off remaining uh, lower for potentially an extended period of time, which means bond prices could resume their uptrend uh, and go higher. So I think, you know, expecting them to go back into this congestion range that we saw in uh, for much of the, the year after the March uh, equity lows certainly appears to be uh, to be a potential. And again, remember that the uh, these things can go in three directions, up, down, or sideways. And I wouldn't be surprised if sideways is the direction of least resistance for the foreseeable future. We need to wrap our show, go right to the three and three, three charts in three minutes. Here we go. Chart number one is consumer. We're looking at consumer discretionary versus consumer staples. I've talked about how these ratios have improved. The reason why I wanted to show this chart today was because of this bottom ratio, which is looking at consumer discretionary, the XLY versus consumer, uh, I'm sorry, versus technology, the XLK. As you can see, this ratio was going higher coming out of the March market low, retested that peak uh, the first week in June, and since then has pulled back a little bit. And the question is, are we able to eclipse that? If this holds here, that tells you there's that rotation back to the safe haven of technology, and that either of these consumer sectors are, an, are, are a bet that is less attractive than sticking with the performance of technology. But if we get a breakout in that ratio, that tells you to get a little more speculative and think about going back into some of the consumer names, especially down the cap tiers, uh, pot potentially. Now, as tech has done well, the leading indicator, which is the relative performance of semiconductors, it is worth noting, has gone to another relative high today, right? So this week, we're making a new relative high for the last 12 months. This relative performance continues to go higher, which tells you just based on the relative performance of semiconductors, people are expecting a market recovery to continue from here. Now, finally, when we think about tech, it's all about the FANG man, the FANG, whatever we wanted, the mega stocks, however we want to describe that group of the mega cap tech consumer comm services uh, names. And we talked about Apple yesterday breaking to new closing highs. Uh, today, we have Microsoft going higher, significantly up almost 4% today, making a new 52-week high again today, a new closing high above uh, yesterday, which had eclipsed the high from uh, February. So if you looked at nothing other than big cap technology, you'd probably feel pretty good about things that concern with Microsoft. It is just hitting the overbought region, which again, on its own, just means the price has gone up a lot. That's not necessarily a bad thing, but what it tells me is start to look for signs of mean reversion and look for signals that stocks are going to come back to earth just a little bit, even if, if a, uh, a meaningful pause before resumption and any sort of uptrend. Folks, that's our show for today. I want to thank Mark Ungewitter from Charter Trust joining us again on the show. The great perspective on breadth for StockCharts.com in Redmond, Washington, I'm Dave Keller. Be safe. Have a great night. 
Hey guys, Grayson Rose here with StockCharts.com. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. Remember, if you did, give us a like down below, leave us a comment, we'd love to hear from you. And most importantly, don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel for daily content from an incredible collection of technical analysts and financial minds. We'll see you back here very soon. Happy charting, my friends.